The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It is time on the mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, joined by Mr. AWL himself, Andrew Wrestling League, Andy Hamilton. Hello, Kyle. AWL1 in the books, baby. What do you think of AWL1? I came in with realistic expectations. Which were? It was probably about 500 people. Just knowing that there were wrestling tournaments happening throughout the state. You had Iowa Iowa State the next day. I knew who was not going to be there. You had college wrestling tournaments. So I had texted you that John Ostendorp, who is just down the road at Coe College, was not going to be there with his team. It would have made sense that he would have been there, but he had a tournament that weekend. So I think there were a lot of things you were battling, and I think overall the product came away fantastic. I had someone who is not necessarily an in-depth amateur wrestling fan. He's a a professional wrestling promoter. He watched it because he was fascinated, and he said the production value was fantastic. He he thought it was good, and he's a critical guy too. So I take that with a lot of weight. I thought the wrestling was good, even though there wasn't maybe an end game on this is leading to something. It was the first try. So really it was an exhibition. And I thought the exhibition was executed very well. The matches were good. There were comebacks. There was action. So I give it probably a, a B minus or a B for the first time around, which is is really high for a a first crack at uh, at something that we've tried before and failed. Is that grading on a curve, or is that just a straight up grade? I'd say it's a straight up grade. Okay. Yeah, just straight up. I, I haven't decided B minus or B. I know you can't disclose numbers on track wrestling's pay-per-view, but it sounds like it was pretty good. So if track feels good about it and feels like they had good numbers and that you guys like the production, then I'd probably bump it up to a B. Action was great, wasn't it? It was good. I mean, especially that last match uh, between Zane Rutherford and Jordan Oliver, the Sammy Brooks was ridiculously good. 97 with, kilos, Kyvan and Jacob Casper. Gosh. That was such a fun match. The, the second period of that match, there yeah. was so much stuff happening. <laughs> they were doing a little merry-go-round there, yeah. and I was like, who's going to get this? And hats off to Jacob Casper because he went after it. Oh, yeah. And I, I liked that because he went for a shot right at the end there and was, was trying to win the match instead of just playing uh, patty cakes there and just staying away and thinking he can't win it. I just thought... Across the board, except for super heavyweight, Zach Ray, I think, was that his last match? Yeah. I think it was his last match. So, uh, great career for him. But uh, I I tell you, Mike Machiavello won a lot of fans over. I think uh, he has a great upside. Bill Zadick was talking about just being glad that he has him in the fold for the next couple of years. So, really give it high marks. I thought uh, it was just a really good product. Yeah, absolutely. I was really impressed with the action, and this guy's got after it. Boy, Conditioning yeah. was a factor, a big-time factor. <laughs> you saw that. Look at uh, 74 kilos, Tommy Gant coming back. Made a lot of fans in Iowa. Tommy he Gant did, did, did with the, the way he came back and won that match against Richie Lewis. And then uh, certainly uh, Sam Brooks had already had a ton of fans in Iowa, mm-hmm. but uh, – uh, that was an impressive comeback from down 4-0, uh, making it uh, – coming back from down 4-0, winning 11-4. I added it up the other day, and I'm going to pull it up. But uh, David Taylor knew what he was doing when he put this <laughs> team together. He went with guys who were world team training partners, so he knew those guys were in shape. He went with guys that he knew were in shape because he knows them really well. Penn State guys, Nico Megalutis, Zane Rutherford – and then he banked on Iowa guys because, you know, Iowa guys probably aren't getting too far out of shape at any point in time. And uh, let me pull this statistic up. Is this is something you created on your own? Just I just added it up. up. David Taylor's team had a 63 to, nine, 63 to 39 edge in match points. They won 7 of 10 matches. And Taylor's team outscored Dake's team 51 to 13 in the second period. Man. 
<laughs> That's where it was won. Great stat there. 51 to 13 in the second period. Yes. Okay. So if you had to give your top three matches just from entertainment point of view, because that's what this was. It was entertainment. Do you have what your top three would be? You don't even have to rank them in order, but what, what matches stood out to you? 65, Rutherford and Oliver. Uh, I think uh, 97 was really fun to watch. And then you go with uh, one of, probably one of the two matches that the, uh, that the Iowa guys won. You know, Sam Brooks or Corey Clark, and maybe a tie, 86 kilos and 61, just because of uh, the fan engagement brought a little more juice to those matches. They were really fun to watch. Uh, Clark getting in those flurries with Ramos in the second period, and then certainly we've talked about uh, Sam Brooks coming back from down 4-0 and putting 11 straight on the board to beat Nick, Nick Heflin. The crowd was really into those matches. You have this unique experience of being around a lot of these Hawkeye guys. In your previous job, where does Tony Ramos stand right now with Iowa fans? Do you think they like him? They tolerate him? Is he disliked? Where is he in all this? Well, I think we saw mixed bag Friday night. Don't you? Mm-hmm. I mean, there were yeah. when he came out, there was some applause and there were some boos. Yeah, I think there, that, there uh, was, it was a mixed bag. I yeah, think that, I, I think that you asked. Probably ten people. You're going to get a little bit of, little bit of. We're still Ramos fans. Love him. Probably going to get a little bit uh, in the middle, and then you're probably going to get some people that are against him now. And and I wrote about the day after the blow up at the Olympic trials that it was a shame that that it occurred. I don't I don't think he handled that the right way. And I don't know. I've never really asked Tony about it if he regrets anything that he said or did after the uh, Olympic trials. But uh, I do know this. I know that it stained the the legacy in the minds of a lot of Hawkeye fans of a guy that was a favorite Hawkeye throughout his career. Even if you dislike Tony Ramos, you have to like him. I know it sounds probably like a Tom Brandsism right now, but <laughs> you have to like Tony Ramos, even if you dislike him, because of what he brings. And he adds that element of interest to the sport. And he even I didn't like the stare downs necessarily, but I did in reality because it heightened what the match was going to be. I'll never to, to interrupt you, Kyle. I'll never forget 2011 on the backside when he wrestled uh, David Thorne at NCAAs, and there was something that went on at the head table. I don't know what, what the confusion was, but Ramos and Thorne were out there, and this stare-down lasted, I don't know, five minutes maybe while they were getting things sorted out at the beginning of the match, getting ready to start on a consolation match. I wish we could find video of that out there somewhere because it was awesome. Can we, can we find awesome. that? It was hilarious. It. You, you need to get that somewhere on track so that people can see that because that is a, a great... A great memory to be able to have, but I, it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out with Tony Ramos to see if he likely will go back down where he fits in on things. I think going up that weight class is a little bit heavy for him. He just hasn't been successful at that 61 kilos. I think he just needs to stay down and I think that's where he's going to have his most success. But I think for both of us, we just want to see all these guys continue to compete. And our guest today, Nathan Tomasello, is going to be in that mix at 57 kilograms. And I, I like that Nathan Tomasello is going to be on our show, partly because we've asked for input from people. And this was a suggestion from Kelly DeShutter, who came to the museum with her fiance, Barry. I'm going to say six months ago, they came, they did a, a nationwide trip. They went to Stillwater. They went to Nebraska to check out the programs. And when her fiance said, or I asked, I said, where are you on the wrestling fandom scale? And where is she? He said, I'm an 89. She's a hundred. And so she listens to all our podcasts. She listens to all the shows on Matt talk online. So for her to suggest her favorite wrestler, who is Nathan Tomasello, thank you, Kelly, for making this suggestion. Thank you for listening. And we need more female passionate involvement like you have. So I'm glad you made the suggestion. So if you do have a suggestion, we will do our best to get that person on the show. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, we will. Yeah, I, I love you, Yeah, suggestions for guests, questions. Yeah, we, we like that. And I, Qu- quiz Kyle. <laughs> yeah, qu- We're going to start that up. We can. We can. Because I the Ask Andy question, I'm still thinking about the question of the one time 
season. You know, just had a one-time season where it was a success, and it still comes back to Stuart Carter for me. But there's got to be other people out there. And, and there's a question that I got the other day that I would love to get your input on. Greatest wrestler, and I don't know if you can say greatest. You'd have to say best wrestler never to be an All-American. Any thoughts on that? No. I, I, <laughs> it's a tough one. I hate answering these questions, like, right on the spot without doing any research. Yeah. Because I know I'm going to forget somebody that's totally obvious to me. It should be obvious to me. Yeah. And the one that comes to mind for me is Nick Pasolano. It, when you say that, that's the number one guy for me. He and Cole Sanderson. I think both those guys weren't All-Americans for Iowa State. And I just thought they could have been. They beat great guys. And they were never All-Americans. So those are two guys that come to me. But that doesn't mean there's not a pool of guys out there as well that, uh, that just deserve to be in there. Yeah, we're going to think up. Let's start digging into this. Yeah, well, we'll come up with some for our next episode. But while we have that, we'll uh, just make sure we plug that Nathan Tomasello will be on this show. Remarkable career. He's going to keep going with it. And so as we're talking about the 57-kilogram weight class, boy, there's going to be a lot of good stuff as we look at 2020 and the guys that are going to be in that weight class. There's going to be a lot of good stuff in every weight class. Well, yeah. But we're starting at the lowest weight class because we've been talking about Tony Ramos. But, man, it's it's going to be a, a complete log jam. And a lot of decisions are going to have to be made. A, a lot of guys, they're going to have to to cut down. Take a guy like Joe Colon. He's got to cut down. There's just no way he can go up a weight class, I think, and be successful there. So it's going to be a, a, a tough weight cut. And we saw what happened to James Green when he had to cut down a couple years ago. Didn't go well. Takes a lot out of you. So you think Cologne's going down? I think he is. And Nashon as well. Yep. Sixty-five. Or, or you look at uh, let's let's go up to seventy. James Green. We already know he's going up. Mm-hmm. Seventy-nine. Kyle Dake absolutely goes down. Okay. I, I'd bet a ton of money on that. Alex Daringer. I think he goes down. I think he goes up. You do. I do. You think he's going up a weight class, mm-hmm. huh? What what leads you to that uh, decision or thought? He's just getting big. He's okay. getting big, and uh, he said something the other night in his post-match interview with David Mercatani that kind of led me to believe he's sinking 86. But uh, Okay, well, he, he's, he's a big Valencia dude. is going up. Yeah, he will go up. 92, uh, Jaden Cox. Whoo, I think he goes up. Do you? I do think he goes up. I just, I've thought that just knowing that he does not like that weight cut down to 86 kilograms that is a bear for him and so i think he's gonna go up and i think he's gonna test it out and see what he can do i think he'd rather gain the weight than lose it because he's a he's a thick guy he's dense in those legs i think he moves up to to challenge snyder what about our guest last week mike machiavello i think he goes down okay i think he goes down so anybody we're forgetting about Probably. There are probably a few guys that uh, that we're leaving off the list, but uh, I, I think the the 70 kilo you'd have to think through there, like Chamberlain, what does he do? Um, probably goes down, I would say, if he can do it. I don't know what, what that would be. I don't know how long Molinero is going to keep with it, but I would say he's going to go down, I would think. I don't think he can go up to 74 kilos. So just... Man, it's it's strange to talk about because you just can't imagine some of these guys going up, but then the thought of them going down too, you just don't know they're going to have any energy to be able to perform. So maybe it weeds guys out. Maybe they can't make the cut. and Maybe they have to, to move up and just test the waters, but it will be like no other. Two-day weigh-in, day of weigh-in really changes things too. Sure does. How about Mark Hall? Whew, you're, you're throwing some good ones here. Mark Hall goes to 74 kilos. I think he goes down. I just don't think he can he can go up that that much. I, and I don't think he likes to cut weight either. But I think he'll he'll go down for that Olympic year. And then he looks a lot bigger now than what he did uh, summer twenty seventeen when he was at seventy four kilos. Yeah. Well, but you're right though. It, uh, the fans are going to win on this one because it's going to be uh, it's going to be playing out in a. An interesting way. We got to start with the on the college side. It, it starts and stops right now with Penn State. This is a unbelievable team. This team, although Lehigh was missing what six starters, I think I read they were. Lehigh's six. been in flux all year. Yeah, 
and and they probably will be. But the game has changed, hasn't it? The the days of saying that we're going to wrestle our best guys. I think coaches are saying we're we're looking at at March only. We're we're going to keep these guys healthy or, or try to get them healthy as much as possible, and we're willing to throw away a few duels if it doesn't matter. I think that game is now being played by coaches more and more all the time. Well, yeah, and look at you know you drop a duel meet. What does it mean? I mean, there are nothing. There are a lot of people in our sport that whether you're playing Monopoly or whether you're competing in dual meets or chess or checkers, whatever, are out to win. And I think most people, most everybody in our sport is wired that way. But there are some that will look at it like, you know what, if we have to drop a dual meet here to do what's best for the individual long term, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. I think a lot of people are that way right now. Yeah. And the the game has changed too that it used to be the protocol was compete internationally after college put all your effort into that now there's just it's a it's a mixed season for some of these guys not across the board but you're seeing it more and more all the time and guys trying out for various world teams there's a variety that you can compete in now and I think that uh, they want their hand at uh, freestyle glory right now and coaches are willing to to hop on board especially at the the higher end programs. Ohio State in particular, yeah, they come to mind. Yeah, I mean Kyle wrestling, going out and testing himself overseas the past couple three years, wrestling at the Oregon in season, wrestling at Clubs Cup, uh, things of that nature. And once Ohio State opened the door for Kyle to do that, and they've got a lot of guys with similar type goals that uh, Tom Ryan thinks a fair thing to do is to let them all. Yeah. You know, if, if uh, you know, and so what we've seen is Miles Martin. Wrestled the U23 World Championships. Colin Moore wrestled at the U23 World Championships, a silver medalist there a year ago. Nathan Tomasello wrestled at the U23 trials, and Tori got hurt, tore his ACL. Yeah. But, you know, McKenna wrestled the U23 World Championships a year ago, bronze medalist. So they're committed to doing it, and I think that they see some value in sending the guys over there and, and doing that type of stuff. And I think that maybe there's some residual of uh, value in recruiting too, because the elite elite kids now who want to win world and Olympic championships, they want to win uh, medals at uh, the, uh, on the international stage and, and they love freestyle. And so you're, you're feeding their passion a little bit. And so I think it's, I think it's been good for Ohio state for the most part. Uh, I think it certainly helped Kyle in his development. And you know, the one downside is that Tomasello got hurt. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and there are downsides to it, but well, you can get hurt in practice too. Yeah, it's a it's a brutal sport. Anything can happen, and we see it across the board. But it's uh, you, I think you're right, though. It is a, a nice recruiting pitch to say we're going to let you be who you want to be. We're not going to force you into a box. If you want to try the international style, then we're the program for you. And I think other programs are open to that. Oklahoma State certainly with Dayton Fix. And we got to spend some time on Gable Steveson. This dude is a stud. This guy is. Uh, I could have told you that three years ago. Well, Kyle. I know. And we've, <laughs> we've talked about this numerous times, but now we have a nice pool of data of what we've seen in a true freshman season for a heavyweight. And this guy's unreal, man. He is. Uh, he's cutting edge. And are you surprised? Not at all. No, neither am I. And we talked about that on the last show. Is that? <laughs> We knew coming in that he was probably the best heavyweight in the country. And, and he, regardless of ranking, I think he's the, the number one heavyweight in the country right now. No question about it. Anthony Casares looked really good. He has. I'm still going with Gable. I think okay. he's the, the Mar number one. coming back. He is. I, uh, I is placing All-American. Yeah. I, uh, and Sam Stoll still yep. in the mix as uh, the top heavyweight. I just, I think what he can do and what we've seen him do, uh, against high level competition. I think Gable Stevenson's the guy right now. He can go get points on his feet, no doubt. He looks like he's improved on the mat too. Yeah. But uh, I'll tell you what, I I watched him go toe to toe with Nick Wazdowski and Kyle Snyder July of 2017 at World Team Training Camp and they were competitive matches in the practice room where Gable was scoring points on those guys and and was you know he was holding his own and to me that's when i thought you know what this guy's going to be a serious serious factor right away out of the gate to win a national title 
So from your vantage point, what's the difference between what Gable Stevenson will do this season and Adam Kuhn when he was a true freshman? Because he set the world on fire, too, and the writing was on the wall that he was going to be good. His true freshman season at Michigan didn't place. Why is Gable Stevenson going to be different? He's got a different skill set. He can go get a lot of points on his feet when he needs to. And he's mature beyond his years. Good balance, incredible uh, technique. He's so good at finishing single legs when he gets a leg up in the air, and he can go get get to a leg. What uh, is is he? Kuhn was, Kuhn was more of the old school heavyweight. Yeah, you know, a, a pummeler, a brawler. Uh, as big as he is now, he wasn't. I mean, he wasn't near as big yeah, he then. Was. Uh, he's a monster of a human being now. <laughs> yes. and, he's uh, huge. He is, yeah, absolutely enormous. And, he's a uh, massive dude. You ever see that video that was floating out there on social media? One of his teammates uh, got Kuhn in, in his smart car. There's like kind of <laughs> kind of like <laughs> a bet it. whether Adam Kuhn would it. fit in his smart car, and he did. It's hilarious. you got to go find it. We'll Man, dig it up. I, I would love to see that. And we'll end with this. We, we have to talk about Iowa against Iowa State. What an incredible duel. Didn't necessarily see it coming, but once you look back, I think you can see it coming because there were some swing matches. Iowa had to pull out all the stops to get a 17-16 to win over Iowa State. And I think I read that it was the only time that this dual meet has been decided by one point. There's been some ties. There's been some other interesting dual meets, but I think this is the first one-point dual meet. It was 1918, wasn't it? Was it nineteen? I think so. Okay, 1918. Yeah, it had to have been. Yeah, because there was a, a fall in there from Marinelli medical and, forfeit. Yeah, or, it, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or default, and yeah. then a major by Spencer Lee. So yeah, you're right. It had to be 1918. But what a what an incredible dual meet! And you just the whole time it was like every second had value, and you're just on the edge of your seat. And you can hardly breathe. And there, those are the the meets that you want to be a part of because you just don't know what's going to happen. And Iowa State won. All the swing matches except one, they get an injury default, and it still wasn't good enough. But I think that uh, I didn't see a 1918 outcome like this. I thought it was going to be a little bit bigger gap for Iowa. Law of percentages would say so, right, that they're not going to win in the last seconds at 41 and 49 and not going to get an injury default at 74, and they won in the final seconds at 84 and won the swing match at 33. In Carver. In in Carver. It, it, yeah, they came from behind and won it. And one of the things that Iowa State has struggled with is staying in the fight against the Hawkeyes. And what is it now? Iowa has won, what, 16 in a row? I don't I don't I know so. the number. It's been 05, I want to say. I think so. It's like won. 46 out of the last 48 or okay. something like that. But they, you know, a lot of those have just been, they've gotten, they've gotten out tough. They've gotten out fought. Uh, they hung in the battle. And what, you know, the, the fun dual meets to me are the ones that, there's a huge range of outcomes that could have happened. When you look back at the scoreboard, Iowa could have won that duel by 25 points. <laughs> yeah, they could have. Iowa State could have won it by, by six or five, I guess. But uh, yeah, maybe six, I guess, if, if Spencer loses the major there at 125. And, and if Warner doesn't come back on a, on a bum leg and yeah. find a way to beat Willie Miklas, Iowa State wins a duel meet. Stoll wasn't going to wrestle. And inserts himself into the lineup and wins a match that Iowa had to have. Yeah, and you look at it, Costello had never beaten him. In, yeah, they're, in, they're wrestling yeah. the state finals, I think. Yeah, it had never won a match against him. So just so many variables that it's it's fun to break this one down because it, it was fascinating beyond anything that I thought was possible. And I think you're going to see what this dual meet really meant with the next three years of data. I think we're going to see if this was legit or what it's going to look like next year at Hilton. I think we need to, the, the next year's dual meet really has gotten heightened by this. And I hope it's not on a Saturday of high school wrestling. I hope they put it on Sunday or someday that a lot of people can get out and enjoy because I think people are going to get out and really embrace that duel. Night dual meet, right? Yeah, let's get a night Friday dual night, meet. Saturday yeah. night, Sunday night, whatever. Yeah, whatever <laughs> whatever it takes to get people there, I think we, I think we want that to happen. You've been to a lot of those. I know you followed it pretty close. Uh, have you seen anything like this? Uh, I don't know. 
In the one where they crammed a ton of people, what, 16,000 people into Carver? That was a pretty good dual meet. Yeah. There were some good matches in there. Morningstar and Reader, Sertzis and Gallic. Um, How met- about the 18-16 one where I think it was Andrew Long was a freshman and so was McDonough? Yeah, they had a was, scrap. They yeah. had a they had a scrap. Is that the that that was the one where uh, uh, Metcalf pinned Mitch Mueller? I think yeah, it was the race stage. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, that was a good duel meet too. There have been some there have been some really goofy things that have happened in Iowa State duels. Yeah, uh, but yeah, tremendous duel meet. I want to go back and watch it all over again. I didn't get a chance to watch it, but uh, saw bits and pieces of it to this point, and listened to Ironside and Stephen Grace on the the radio for quite a bit of it and man it uh it sounded like it was bonkers isn't it interesting wrestling is one of the few sports that a loss actually can improve your ranking and your perception of a team it's uh <laughs> i think we even in the loss i think we're viewing iowa state as a, a better team than we ever have or, or could have imagined i didn't think they'd be this far along and that's why i think the next three years of data is going to be important to see really where they are in the in the scope of things. Yeah, but. let's see like, like the the challenge too with teams coming along is consistency. Can you you can pop up there and do it once? Can you do it from start to finish throughout the year? How will they how will they stack up against a similar team when they run into Oklahoma State? Yeah. A team that's that's pretty strong 1 through 10. Good dual team with bonus potential in there. It's going to be key for them. They're going to they're going to face some other battles throughout the way. Uh, I'm I'm really intrigued to see what uh, where where this thing goes for Iowa State, and then the other point I would make is this kind of illustrates to me why we need to come up with some type of dual championship in here somehow, some way, because that is a that was case in point why dual meets are awesome. Yeah, that they can. You know, the momentum can swing so fast. Kyle, we never added it up. What would point differential index have well, been on that? Did I you didn't add it, up? add it up, but I heard that Iowa outscored Iowa State in points. I don't know what it was, but I had heard that. And so immediately when I did hear that, I thought of our conversation thinking that Iowa would have won that. So, of course, you'd have to give 22 points for the medical forfeit and then the, the fall. So that would have to factor in there, too. So I don't know if... When I got that, if that that factored in, but I don't think that would tip the scales in Iowa State's favor. But as we're talking about Iowa State, and I think you're you're going to add these up, who is who is Iowa State's all American? As we talk about balance, who who would be the the guy that would be in the lead to to be your all American? They had one qualifier last year, and so who do you put in that mix? Is saying there's the, your your rock solid all American? I don't know Willie that there Mickles. is one. Willie yeah. Mickles, he's done it a couple times okay. already. Uh, he would be number one. Yeah, he would be, be to me three-time All-American already. Yeah, I mean you got to think. In '97, cleared out a little bit. I would say Willie Miklas would be the number one guy. I think Jarrett Deegan as well. Round of twelve guy last year, forty-nine. Not one of the premier weight classes in college wrestling right now. Uh, like Austin Gomez. Yeah, like the way that that guy competes. But thirty-three is super deep. <laughs> it's log jam there. So we have the breakdown here. We have the scores thanks to Andy Hamilton's mathematical mind, 76 to 67 in favor of Iowa. If we count falls as 22 points and injury defaults, which happened at 174, so Iowa would have come out on top in our point differential index. And that's about what you would expect if you're winning 19 to 18. Makes sense? Sure. Yeah. So, I think so. Yeah, I I think that would be far more indicative. So I don't want us to lose momentum on PDI. I, I still think it's a great concept, even if it's not used for cumulative scoring. I think it's a useful tool to track how good a, a season is and how the, the season is progressing. But I think we can t- need to continue to do this is look at important dual meets and figure out what the the score would be based on pdi so i'm glad we did this and in breaking it down we'll we'll continue to do that with various duels throughout the season the one area i'll be interested to see is if a team loses in the dual meet on the traditional scoring but wins in our scoring it'll be fun to see if that uh, that balances out we're able to get a, a score that ends up that way i think we will a couple times i think there'll be some that there'll be a couple falls in there maybe and you're going to get 44 points and it's going to make the difference. I, 
I would like to see one where there's one fall and the rest are decisions, and then uh, and then you win the entire duel meet based on one fall. That's I'm o- mayhem. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm okay with that happening. So we will uh, we will see if that materializes, and we'll leave it with this. You're right. Hey, we're in a, an interesting time. So we talk about how the game has changed in wrestling. There is absolutely no end game on dual meets anymore. National duels is gone, so it is a traditional dual meet season. You're going to have a smattering of tournaments throughout the year, but it really is your conference tournament qualifier and then the NCAA championships. That's what matters right now, and coaches are adjusting to make sure that their athletes are prepared for the end. I say we get to our guest. I'm with you. All right, let's do it. Andrew, our guest today, has some unique statistics. We like stats, and the one that stands out to me the most is that he is 7-0 and on the biggest day of the wrestling season, that's Saturday of the Division I NCAA Championships. He has the most wins on Saturday of the NCAA Championships. He's an NCAA champion, placed third three times in a row, four-time Big Ten champion. It's Nathan Tomasello of Ohio State. How are you, Nathan? I'm good. That's a really cool statistic. I didn't think I didn't even know that. Well, you earned Thanks. it. You earned that statistic. Thank you. What, what's that like to uh, to be on Saturday? Not not only is it seven and zero on Saturday at seven and zero against all Americans. When you're in a situation like that after winning as a freshman, you come back and get third three consecutive years. That takes a lot to be able to come back and place third at the NCAA championships. How do you keep at a high level to be able to maintain the focus to get there? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of it comes down to uh, who you are as a competitor, you know, you lose in a a big match in the semis, a couple of heartbreakers. And then it shows kind of your character. I think when you are able to come back and let that, let the match go and be able to focus in on uh, at least the two ones that you have in the morning, um, after either after a loss or even for my freshman year after I won, be able to focus in on the finals and um, and that, and then just having the team, thinking about the team a lot too. I knew each year we had we we're in the running um, to win it or be in the top three as a team, and so every point mattered, and I knew that. And so, and uh, I, I love starting out the book, guys, and uh, it was great to just kind of get the fire going in the morning and. Uh, be able to to win some matches. Nathan, after you win the title there as a freshman and, and, you know, as Kyle mentioned, coming back three times for third, what, what is your process like on Friday night after the semifinals in those three years? What does it look like? And what are the biggest challenges with, with resetting and getting yourself ready for Saturday morning? Yeah. Um, well, first it's, it's after the match, being able to uh, get some weight off, um, I usually would, that would be kind of my time to wind down when I'm on the, I'm on the bike or whatever I'm doing to lose some weight and then, uh, assess the situation and then move forward. And the biggest thing is just, uh, being able to let the, let the match go, learn from it. And, um, just having coaches around me that cared helped a lot. Coach Ryan, Jay, Travell. Um, even Lou Rizzelli when he was here, it was, just, it was just really good to have them and Coach Ralph as well. So that they were able to kind of help me um, just mentally be able to focus in on coming back in the morning. And um, I remember Jay telling me, he's like, hey, you've been here before. I know it's really sucks, but you're a leader and we need you, need you a lot in, uh, in the morning. And that was this past year. Um, in Cleveland and especially in Cleveland since this is my hometown I wanted to leave a, a lasting memory for all the people that helped support me as I uh, grew up uh, in the area. You said something interesting there that is not interesting to wrestling people but it would be to another sport you said I had to lose some weight and so that just comes with the territory in wrestling but when you have to do that how does that process into what you have to do to compete is that a good thing does that take your mind off what you have to do uh take us through what that means yeah um i mean with wrestling especially with the lighter weights even the middle weights um everything is kind of structured as far as like with the national tournament and other 
other tournaments, like you have to plan out kind of what you're going to do after you, after your dunks each day. You have to weigh in. And so for me, a lot of times was someone sit on the bike so I can get on the bike right after I compete. And, um, yeah, and then that either um, – that, that kind of just – plays into it and then like i said it just helps me kind of wind down as opposed to you lose you go back to the hotel room and that's all you're thinking about i think just being able to get on the bike listen to some music and kind of zone, zone out a little bit and um just be able to relax and and because uh, obviously there's a bunch of emotions going on through your head and um you're trying to replay the match but the biggest thing is just being able to uh, focus in on the next day and um, like letting letting go, and that's that could be really tough, especially because your your dream of being on the big stage and uh, winning is gone, and the best you can take is is third. So, do you ever think about how this will apply to the rest of your life? Because you did get a setback and you got two wins three times in a row. I don't know if it sinks in now, but I would think at some point that's going to be a, a useful tool as you navigate the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's been great with just being able to use that as kind of a platform to talk to kids when I do wrestling clinics about um, with setbacks, going through setbacks uh, with, with losses and then same thing with injuries and being able to come back even stronger from that. And um, and I think it's just been really really great to to show people, you know, everyone, just kind of how you you react to that loss and and how you come back. That really, I think, impacts and shows people who you truly are and the way you hold yourself. And so that's what I try to I try to do. And um, and it's just it's exciting because I think now I get a chance to really focus in on coming back and wrestling in international in the next few years and see what I got. And so um, it, it's it's fun. And I'm glad that Rudis has been really supportive and Max Effort, my two sponsors. Uh, they Rudis even came up with a, a warrior shirt that has been really cool to be able to sell a little bit and just kind of talk about, like, everyone's a warrior, especially in, in, the, in the wrestling world. And um, just having kind of that nickname, I guess, coined a little bit with just, going through some some adverse times not many people start their career at 125 bump up to 133 for their junior season then come back to 125 why the decision to bump down i know you had to make space for another wrestler but how difficult was that to shrink your body back down to that weight class yeah it was absolutely one of the most challenging things i've gone through getting back down to that weight not just from getting back down to it, but then also having to uh, deal with uh, a torn ACL and also compete at the highest level at a really low weight class. And so it just, it was a challenge on me mentally and challenge on me physically. And I knew that if our team had a legitimate chance at winning another team championship, the best place for me would be, the 125 pound weight class for, for us to do it. And then um, just, I knew that it would be a great way to start the bulk guys off. I, like I said, I enjoy the role of being the guy that goes out first and sets the fire, sets the tone. And so, um, yeah, during this season, I didn't, last season, at least I didn't get a chance to compete until January. So I missed half the season. And, uh, and then just, yeah, maintenance throughout the week was, was the biggest thing um just had to be really really good with my nutrition and uh, it's a learning process you, everyone's a little bit different how their body reacts to different foods and uh the stress of competition travel and um i, I definitely think that the nutrition and just being able to take um time just to relax we're, we're big and so um it's just it was a learning process and it was just a good good opportunity to keep growing, keep learning, and just understanding when I do go back down to it, when I wrestle uh, internationally at 57, which is about the same weight, how to um, maintain and grow in my strength and just be able to uh, compete at that weight at a high level. 
Nathan, where are you in the uh, rehab process, and and what do you have your eyes set on now for your next competition? Yeah, I uh, I'm past seven months out now. Um, I'm officially cleared to start going at it. Um, the doctors are kind of waiting, or they were wanting to wait for me to compete towards the beginning of the year. Um, so solid training, but not wearing the brace at all. It feels my knee feels really normal at this point. Strength and agility wise, I feel like it's back to normal and uh just been able to put on some more speed and, and strength uh, i think just from doing so much rehab um with with my knee and so i'm excited to compete again in the next month or two and see what i got now that i'm fully healthy because i was dealing with the injury since last october and so it's good to finally be uh good to go you know and knowing that i can trust my knee in every situation You have the unique experience of saying that you have wrestled Thomas Gilman, Corey Clark, and Spencer Lee. Compare and contrast wrestling those three three guys. Yeah, they're all really good competitors. They're really a different challenge in in that aspect. Um, Corey Clark was good from a two-on-one. He had good low singles. He was good at uh, at riding on top. Um, And Spencer Lee, similar with... uh, yeah, I think he was the best out of three at, at riding on top and turning. He just did a good job staying on my hips and getting to the wrist or the arm bar. He's really good at that. And uh, he had a good fireman, pretty good hand fighting, and uh, just solid overall. And Gilman was uh, the bruiser. He's going to fight you hard and stay in great position and really stingy with uh, his his hands, head hands off or defense. And, um, yeah, just tried really hard. And so those three were both, uh, all three really challenges in their self. And it was good to, to test every single time when I wrestled with them, wrestled with them this past five years. So it was good. Those are great competitors. Spencer scoring a ton of points on tilts. What makes that so effective for him? Yeah, I mean, he has a great feel on top. I, I think there's a lot of technique that you can show and learn from, but he just, then there's also a feel and he kind of has that feel on top where he knows how to keep, keep weight down on your hands and stay tight on you. Even when you're trying to move on bottom and, uh, he just does a good job. Like I said, riding the hip a little bit and getting to the, to the arm bar and tilts from there. And, uh, he's just solid. That's definitely his best position. And he, uh, he's good. And it's, uh, it was a challenge for me, especially dealing with the knee injury during the season, being able to move on bottom. And so I just felt like that was kind of a little bit of a disadvantage when I wrestled him. And uh, so at least in the Big Tens and the finals of Big Tens and the uh, national semis, both of those, the plan was not to go bottom on him unless I had to. You wrestled in the U23s. I think that's where you got injured, wasn't it? U23s in Rochester, unless it was already before that yeah against state yep. fix yeah but why the decision to do that given that it's your senior year you're going into it seems like it's more commonplace especially at ohio state these guys want to wrestle internationally why risk it yeah i mean that's been kind of the culture i felt like with coach ryan and travel uh, just just being really open to compete internationally and even compete during the season and the last few years i mean Miles Vaughn and Colin just got back from the U twenty threes and Kyle compete competed the last two years with an international schedule and with a college schedule. So they've been always really open to to try uh making a US team and um I wanted to try it since last year I was uh that was probably gonna be my last year to make the U twenty three team and so I I wanted to try it. Um I think if I had to look back I probably would have went off to 61 just because then it wouldn't have been too much of a cut. I would have just competed a little bit heavier and then brought my weight back down. And I think probably that led to part of it was probably led to getting injured because I had to make 25 really early on as opposed to kind of getting my weight used to it. Um, And so uh, the biggest reason was just I wanted to try to make a U.S. team and see what I had to do uh, to do that. And so. 
it, it was a good tournament. Like I said, it no one no one expects uh, an injury like that from wrestling in it. And so, um, like I said, it's always a learning process and and understanding when to plan out a tournament and what the best time is to compete. And so, just doing a good job uh, going forward of knowing, understanding my body and um, knowing uh, when to turn it up and when to have more downtime. How do you think Dayton Fix will do at 133? He's good. I mean, he's a good competitor. Again, uh, he's he's uh, he's Really fast. He's got good technique. I think he's a contender. I mean, I think he he has uh, a lot of good skills. I'm excited to watch uh, watch him, watch the other guys at 33. It's definitely a deep weight class, and so um, I mean, I think I think he's a he's a great great wrestler, and I'm excited um, to get another opportunity to wrestle him. Hopefully, in the next uh, couple of years in the international scene. Nathan, as you, you bounce back between 25 and 33 and you look uh, back on your career, who's one guy that you didn't get the chance to wrestle that you really would have welcomed that opportunity? Uh, well, two guys come to mind. Um, Deshaun Garrett, we never got a chance to wrestle in college. Um, he was always at either uh, the one year is at 33, I was at 25, but the year we were both at 25, I think that was the year I won it. He lost early on, got upset. We never got a chance to wrestle. So he's always a fun guy that is really explosive and fast. And so I would have loved to wrestle him in college. And then uh, Darian Cruz, we never got a chance to wrestle in college. Wrestled probably four or five times in high school. And uh, he's always a fun fun guy to compete against as well because he's got a really a lot of good skills, a lot of good moves. And uh, it's a surprising because we we're always kind of similar in weight. We never get wrestled in college, so when you go, yeah, those two, those two came to mind. You go through five years of college, you redshirted, and now you have to come out the backside. And we've talked about your international career. There's just a lot of buzz around the Ohio State program. You're in a, a great environment where people are talking about you. And then it's kind of like, what's next? Do you feel like there's an emptiness after you get out of college? How do you deal with knowing what the next step is, given that really there's only one spot in your weight class that means anything? How do you how do you deal with that pressure? I mean, it's a, it definitely is a, a transition, I would say, after you, you finish up college, because then uh, you really, it becomes more, you're now a professional athlete, and you're making kind of, your own schedule as far as what works best for you as far as training goes, um, competition goes, and then the coaches are kind of assisting you in that manner. And um, and then just kind of understanding that you're affiliated with the college team, but now you're done with, with competing at that, with that team. And so I'm trying to have a senior RTC uh, leader in the room and just, help younger guys that are there uh, wrestle with them almost every day and help them in that aspect. And then for me going forward, the biggest thing is just right now I'm just trying to learn and get better uh, working with different coaches, wrestling with different partners. I wrestle guys at 125 all the way up to 165 in the room. And um, it's just, it's fun to get different feels and, and uh, just getting the opportunity to kind of go around and train with, other people and other coaches and um, then just picking and choosing which tournaments I want to do to, to progress and get better and then um, get ready for the U S open and the world team trials come April and June. And um, I think the biggest thing right now is just being excited to compete. I'm really excited to compete again soon. And, and then just carrying that into uh, the world team trials and um, the Olympic trials the following year, just being excited to see what I got. And uh, I don't think I'll have any regrets if if I put everything into it and uh, and know that I've given everything I've got. It is kind of a strange transition that wrestlers have to make because it really is uh, top heavy when you're in the youth movement. You're wrestling maybe a hundred matches in a season, and then if you if you look at the NBA, they have 82 games. It's the the highest you can get. You're playing more games than ever, and then you get in wrestling. 
the international style, you're not wrestling as much as you did in college or in high school or even at, at yeah. youth level. What's your advice on how to make that transition and make it feel like it's still important and relevant? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is just being excited to about the little the little um, things that you learn and grow in the tr- in the training sessions because it's more training than it is competition. You'll, I'll probably compete once every six to eight weeks in a competition throughout the year. And then obviously the big one being the world team trials in June. And uh, just, I would say not looking too far ahead and just valuing the small things. Like if I picked up a little technique from um, one of the coaches or one of my partner showing me something, just, just being excited about that, you know, excited to, to learn and get better and valuing improving uh, little by little, you know, and then seeing what you have at, when you do go out and compete. I think that's been the biggest thing in my mind the last uh, few months as far as getting back to, to wrestling here is just valuing the little, little technical things that I've gotten better at. And same thing with strength goals, getting better strength-wise, agility goals, stuff like that. Just valuing the little things has been important for me. And then, um, yeah, just getting excited to compete again. Does American Wrestling League add to your excitement the possibility of still competing in that? They had the first one. Do you feel like that could help you enhance your career? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think right now, this first year, I probably will stay out of it. Um, I was asked to compete, but I think right now I'm going to just do a few international tournaments leading up to the trials and seeing how the American Wrestling League goes. But I think they, they're doing a really good job uh, promoting it and just getting some of the, the elite senior guys to compete and just creating some buzz around it. I think it's always fun to watch some of the guys that um, you're hoping to watch in college matchup wise that sometimes they didn't get a chance to wrestle each other. And so I think um, it, they're doing a good job of kind of putting a pro league together. and Hopefully it keeps growing and keeps getting uh, stronger as the years progress. You hear about guys that get out of college and they get into international wrestling and then it just opens the floodgates and they can do things in the room and they can relax. So let's just take what it was like to wrestle Luke Pletcher last season and then what it's like to wrestle him now. Are you dominating him? <laughs> Luke's Luke's tough, man. His defense, his head hands defense is good. I mean, someone gets in. His leg defense is good. I mean, he's he's a he's a good competitor. So we go back and forth. Um, I would say a lot of times I would get the better of him, but he's he's challenged. I mean, he's another top thirty three pounder that wrestles really good, and, uh, stingy, and he's got good technique and. He's agility's good, and so he's just a fun guy to go with. He has a good feel as far as if you want to spar with him, or same thing with going live. It makes it makes me he makes me better every day, and I hope I do the same with him. When did you first acquire the nickname NATO? Yeah, I think on the forums, people were t- tired of writing how my long last name, which is Tomasello, Nathan Tomasello. So I think. On the wrestling form, it started just being abbreviated and ATO because those, those are kind of my first two initial, uh, first two letters of my uh, of my first and last name. So N A T O NATO, and then Flo, I think somehow got a hold of it and then started putting out NATO, and then all of a sudden, my teammates start calling me it, and then all the wrestling fans <laughs> start calling me it. I'm like. Okay, that's awesome. And um, I think that was my sophomore year when it really started to become big. And then I was like, all right, I'll just embrace it. And so I kind of put my Instagram and Twitter as that name. And uh, it, it's cool to have a nickname in, in college. I guess it means you made it big a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it's really cool that um, everyone can call me NATO. You know, it's, it's, it's a fun nickname and it's just – it's cool to uh, be able to show it, you know? 
Yeah, it sounds very political too. It just it sounds like it uh, some treaty or NATO. I think there is a NATO maybe. So it uh, it's a cool. Yeah, cool nickname. Now let's talk about uh, two people that aren't in wrestling. You mentioned that uh, you are from Ohio. You live in Ohio. LeBron James goes to the Lakers. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I was really grateful for what he's done for Cleveland, the city. I mean, not only did he bring a championship, but he brought a lot of business back in the city, a lot of a lot of positive uh, impact in that fa- in that way. And um, I, I mean, I, I understood uh, when he, I was like, when he, if he wants to leave, I, I totally understand that. I mean, at that point, it's it's more uh, his decision, and uh, him him coming back was really cool to see. I think. It really showed a lot of maturity of him coming back from Miami to Cleveland and, and just with some of the teams we had in Cleveland, I mean, he had to really take on a big role, and uh, it shows. I mean, this year, Cleveland's last in, in the conference, and so he he did he did a great job. And so I, I would say just hats off to him. I hope he has a great wrestling career, and maybe he can finish out in Cleveland. All right, a a guy that's a big wrestling fan that stepped down. Urban Meyer, the head football coach at Ohio State, stepping down. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I originally heard some rumors that he might. And uh, for originally, I was like, I I couldn't believe it. I mean, he's he's the face of Ohio State football. Everyone knows who Urban Meyer is, and he's won championships with Ohio State with Florida. Really, really good coach, and uh, just the health things. I mean, the stress. I mean, I can't imagine. I see how much stress Coach Ryan has with our team, and that's just wrestling. And football is is. I mean, it's it's huge in college. I mean, that's where a lot of schools make money is from the football. And so, if the football team isn't doing good, especially with the tradition that Ohio State has, I mean, it, I can't imagine. And so when he's dealing with this tumor in his brain. And it, I just, I was like, uh, it's probably the best thing for him. And uh, like I said, just, he's been a great coach. I mean, he's been actually at a few of our matches when uh, I was competing. And so it's just really cool to see. He just seems like a really, really genuine guy. And uh, he's brought a lot of good things to Ohio State. What was it like being part of that 2015 NSA team championship for Ohio State? It was incredible. I definitely would say the the night uh, that we won it, um, that after celebration kind of at the hotel was one of my favorite memories I can think of in my life. Um, just being able to thank so many of the fans. All my family was there. And um, just it, it just felt surreal a little bit, being able to bring Ohio State a championship. I mean, Ohio... I believe is known as one of the best high school wrestling states. And it, it, we should have it definitely should be one of the best college wrestling states as well. And not to have a championship before them, it was just good to see that we finally, that we're able to get it done and bring that national championship to Ohio. And um, it was just cool. And just being able to, to win it. And, um, and that fashion was awesome. And then just kind of, Going, looking back at that season, we kind of had an up and down season. And I think what really brought us together was um, we lost at the uh, national duels to Lehigh, which was a big upset. And then we had about a week and a half before the Big Tens. And I think it just, it really was a humbling experience. And I think it just brought everyone from the team together. And uh, we just, having the Big Tens at Ohio State, my freshman year was huge. There's so many fans that showed up. It got so loud at St. John Arena. It was just it was incredible. And that, I think, carried us through the national championship. And um, and same for myself. I took taken four losses that year, all the top guys, all to some top guys, and I was able to make some corrections and put it together at the national tournament in big times. Even though it didn't end with an NCAA championship this past season, the 2017-2018 season, the duel between Penn State and Ohio State, and I don't, just, I don't mean just the dual meet that you guys had just throughout the season. It was clear 
that it was going to be one of you, those two teams to be part of that, to be part of something so exciting. Take us through what it's like to be an athlete on your senior season in an exhilarating season like that. Yeah, it was it was fun. I mean, the hype between us and Penn State was, was sweet. We, we both knew that we were definitely battling for it, for the championship as a team. And, and um, it just, it's good. It's good to know that it, there's a huge challenge and it just pushes and motivated uh, our guys. And I'm sure it did the same with Penn State as well. And so we knew that everything, every point was going to matter. And um, it just, it was a good team race. And I thought that it helped, it keeps helping uh, the wrestling in general as a sport grow and reach more people and hopefully even become more popular. I mean, that's the biggest thing. If you keep, I would say the last 10 years, definitely it's grown in a sense where like people know who the top guys are. This even random fans, like they, they know who you are. You know, it's crazy to think about it. I don't know if it was that big 10 years ago, you know, and I just think that it's been really cool to see that uh, people are following it more, you know, and um, I think in the years to come, it'll keep getting bigger. As far as how you view Penn State, you're in the program that's competing against them. You know, it's your biggest rival. How do you view it internally? Do you dislike those guys? Do you have uh, just a, an amount of respect? Take us through that. Yeah, um, there, there's some really good guys on their team. I've uh, hung out with Zane Rutherford before, Nolf before. Um, those guys are really cool guys. Bo Nichols seems like a cool guy, too. Um, and, I mean, there's definitely respect there. I, I think in the moment when you're competing against them, there's always, like, some anger because you want to just beat them so bad. But, you know, I, you know how hard the other people train. And, you know... It's just there's a certain amount of respect because you know how tough the sport of wrestling is. It's it's a challenge and uh, it takes everything you have, and so it's just good. I, I know that they got a great room, we got a great room, so it, it's fun. All right, we'll end with this. You're a nice guy. How do you be a nice guy and stay competitive? Yeah, there has to be a switch. I would say I'm really humble. I try to be really humble at least and uh honest and and just really try to connect with fans and um just anyone in general but then when i am going out to competition just like i said being a warrior and having that warrior mentality when i go out there warrior champion mentality where i'm going after it i'm going to attack and i'm going to try to dominate you know and not being afraid that's the biggest thing is when you know there's going to be nerves going right before the match you just got to believe that your training that you put in and and just going after it and that's been my mantra is be on the attack i'm the best when i'm attacking the guy and i'm moving my hands moving my feet and using my strength god's definitely blessed me with uh with strength and uh just being able to use that strength and my speed and so that's that's kind of how i look at it um I want to be able to use the sport of wrestling to glorify God and connect with people and, and show uh, others his his genuine, genuine love for others through it. But then with my wrestling, when I go out there, that's, that's what I think about. So. All right. We appreciate this interview. Remember this. It's a way of life. And if some other company tries to market that, it's mine and mine alone. Don't let Rudis or anyone else try to take that because <laughs> – I just invented that on the spot, Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, but it is. Brutus is awesome, man. Yep. They do a good job. So. Yep. We appreciate this. Thanks for coming on the program. We can't wait to see you continue to compete, hopefully through, I don't know, what's the the end game for you? 2032? Can we see you through then? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We'll see, man. I, I, I'd love to stay there that long. So as long as I'm healthy, I'll keep competing. All right, we appreciate it. That was Nathan Tomasello for Andy Hamilton. I'm Kyle Klingman. You have been listening to On the Mat. This 
show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.